Now, I'm honored to introduce the speaker who will make the keynote address for our discussions this year around the theme of fresh air. When he wrote about the PSFS, it was in an article called What Goes Unnoticed. With discerning perception, I think he captures the essence of the place we, we will inhabit in the next few days in these words. The treatment of the building's surfaces inside and out works toward a goal of laconic precision or a kind of muted splendor. Little or nothing is applied to the building's materials, neither paper nor paint. Instead, each piece of steel or stone is polished to a specified degree. Representation is thus avoided and the things themselves are exposed. When perception is attentive, I think it becomes a creative act. This sensitivity to the building's surfaces and to the effect of its materials and finishes is the key to the apprehension of what David Leatherbarrow calls the architectural setting. The acknowledgement of the subtle transformation of this setting over time adds humility to the architect's work. The architect may be finished with it, but the building is always in the process of completing itself. Similar attention to site orientation, to light, and to the multiple horizons created by building levels relative to their immediate and distant topographies establish the currency of architectural settings at many scales and contexts from landscapes to cities. Those of you who have read his books or been fortunate to attend his lectures or to study or teach with him, appreciate the richness and depth of scholarship he brings to bear on practical issues of architectural design. Attention to processes of construction and to architecture's relation to technology make it possible, for instance, in surface architecture, for him to discern three different ways in which Le Corbusier treated the relation between free facade, window wall, and load-bearing columns in the 30s. In that small space between them, the Salvation Army building, the Swiss Pavilion, and the Clarté apartment building. The structural steel columns there are coincident with the building's outer surface. In the Swiss Pavilion, they approach the outer surface, engaging the primary divisions of the window. And in the Salvation Army building, the columns are recessed behind glass, disappearing. With his erudition, he does not neglect that Le Corbusier's artistic contemporaries, the painters Matisse and Dufy, were rehearsing the very same ambiguities of depth in the picture plane quote, variously merging and separating the landscape and the interior. The interdisciplinary relation between architectural production and technology and representation is a constant theme. David Leatherbauer's influential books, Topographical Stories, Surface Architecture, Uncommon Ground, The Roots of Architectural Invention, and On Weathering have won international acclaim. In 2003, the Bruno Zevi Prize for Surface Architecture, and in 1995, from the AIA for On Weathering. He has taught architectural design, history, and theory since 1984, and was departmental chair at the University of Pennsylvania between 1992 and 98, where he now is professor of architecture and chairman of the PhD program. Recipient of many honors and awards, David Leatherbarrow won the G. Holmes Perkins Faculty Award at the University of Pennsylvania, was the Cass Gilbert Distinguished Professor at the University of Minnesota, and a visiting scholar at the Centre Canadien d'Architecture. His very first keynote address was an ACSA Northwest Regional Conference. I don't know if you remember, David, it was called The End of Theory. That was 20 years ago. <laughs> In just the last six years, he has delivered keynote addresses at conferences in France, Brazil, China, Ireland, Thailand, Great Britain, Mexico, Australia, Puerto Rico, and even as far off as Oregon and Kansas. 
I am pleased that he has agreed to make his first keynote address of 2007 in Philadelphia with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming David Leatherbarrow. The title of the conference is the title of my paper. Fresh Air, as you know, is also the name of a widely enjoyed radio program on NPR, based, I'm happy to say, in Philadelphia. Apparently, the name was chosen because early interviews were conducted both outdoors and outside the framework of established protocols. Because our conference organizers have adopted this title, I suspect they want us to be similarly adventurous even if we give our lectures inside this wonderful building. In everyday usage, though, fresh air indicates an efficient cure for conditions that have become disagreeably stuffy or stale. It's probably safe to assume that no designer intends stagnated situations, yet self-contained enclosures do become oppressive even if well designed, as do other unventilated places. Think, if you will, of airplane interiors during long flights. But architecture isn't the only cause of staleness. The mere passing of time can have this effect on food, for example. Likewise, for interpersonal conditions, friendships can go sour after a while, also working relationships. As most, if not all of you, are educators, this last instance brings me to my opening question. Has architectural education gone stale in our time? If so, if the courses, studios, and programs of study you know have become airless, somewhat or entirely so, what do you think what do you think might refresh them? Are the resources for renewal to be found within the discipline itself? Or, or must we look elsewhere? I take it our general purpose in this meeting is to ask what might breathe or is already breathing fresh air into architectural teaching and research. Given the fact I've started my presentation by invoking city streets and a nationally broadcast radio program, it's probably clear to you already. I think the renewal of what is within our field depends on opening to what's outside it. Fresh air, announced the great French modernist poet Stéphane Mallarmé, fresh air is the beginning and end of the question. The search after truth, he said, which enables modern artists to see and reproduce nature with just and pure eyes, must lead them to adopt air almost exclusively as their medium. Mallarmé issued this declaration in 1876 in a spirited defense of the so-called plein air paintings of Edouard Manet. Freshness he said, is not found all at once. Freshness, indeed, frequently consists in the coordination of widely scattered elements. He had in mind a course of study, tonight I want to call it a curriculum, that included both contemporary and historical examples, referring alternately to Corbet and then later to Velasquez. Yet for Mallarmé, more than artistic truth was at issue in Manet's paintings. The opening of artistic practice and technique, as well as the doors of the academy, to fresh air extended a democratic impulse, insofar as it forced the artist to dispense with the traditional arrangement of forms in a hierarchical order. Another contemporary, named Bazir, saw Manet's painting similarly. Quote, the landscape he depicts, a landscape such as the one you see here, Manet in a boat, lives and is vibrant with light. The air moves 
And now, now we are far away from those well-groomed trees in conventional paintings approved and promulgated by tradition. Next, fresh air or open air in a different sense. Profoundly dissatisfied with the stuffy classrooms of traditional schools and programs of study, Johannes Deuker argued for, quote, an approach toward life in the fresh air, on a higher plane. The improvement of school buildings, he thought, would require the dematerialization of construction. More specifically, the provision of airy rooms under well-insulated roof with little mass, enclosed by many large-size operable windows. Gone would be the closed-in interior, even if its disappearance meant an end to the coziness associated with cottage-like schoolhouses, inadequately ventilated by quaint but undersized windows. If fresh air and daylight were to be let into classrooms in sufficient quantities, more than shutters would need to be removed. Outer walls, outer walls would have to be freed from the burden of structural support. Also, large sections of the windows would have to be made operable. The rule was this, minimal material, maximum transparency. All the effort was necessary because the let's call it the departmental status quo, was no longer acceptable. With rather biting irony, Doiker observed, quote, there are two different types of school at the moment. The normal school that produces patients and the open air school that tries to heal them. Now the third of my four emblematic cases. About a decade after the open air school in Amsterdam was completed, a German emigre named Max Cheto arrived in Mexico City, having spent time in study or collaboration with Hans Polzig, Ernst May, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Richard Neutra. After an initial period of partnership with Louis Berragon, once his independent career was underway, Cheto developed a strong interest in an architectural type native to the Americas. In his modern architecture in Mexico, he observed that after Cortes, architecture in that country produced, quote, only one invention, which came into being during the 16th century and did not survive it. And that was the open chapel. You see on the left in plan, likewise in elevation. Cheto's claim was based on two sources, his own knowledge of European and American history and an exhaustive study of these buildings by John McAndrew, a friend and colleague. That the open chapels were evidences of conquest was plain, but he thought one could also see in them, quote, the first hesitant signs of an integration of the Indian and Iberian cultures. For within the precincts of the open chapel, mass was celebrated for converted Indians, and on feast days, crowds filled spacious enclosed patios. He continues, the fact that the open chapel became so firmly entrenched was doubtlessly due to its analogy with the destroyed Indian temples and their liturgical function. Cheto, like McAndrew, was sensitive to the tension between persuasion and persecution. Yet both described the open or fresh air church as a pretext for sharing, a setup for experiences of mutuality. You can see the open air chapel to the left of the main entrance, there in plan, and a view in approximately that form. Outdoor preaching was common in Europe but rarely was mass conducted in the open, as in these Mexican examples. Moreover, the provisions set out in the atria of the New World churches were permanent, unlike the props of the European parallels. The open chapel to the left, 
there in reconstruction. Another difference is that the open air space was used for schooling, theatrical displays, care for the sick, burial of the dead, and most importantly and surprisingly for me, non-Christian, which is to say native religious functions. Opening the church allowed for bridging between its curriculum and pre-conquest institutions of prosaic affairs. Fresh air brought two traditions together into life. The last of my preliminary examples is entirely contemporary. Reflecting on developments in both architecture and landscape architecture, Peter Latz observed that a fresh history and a fresh understanding of the contaminated site and of the landscape have been developing in our time. The fear of pollution and contamination has given way to a calm acknowledgement of existing structures. Further, Lotz suggested, once we face up to the actual condition of many parts of our cities and landscapes, their deep toxicity, we'll see the need to break free from old assumptions about the first premises of design, the neutral site, beneficent nature, its pastoral qualities, and so on. And once freed from stale doctrine, new life in gardens or public activities, new life can be breathed into both design practice and disused places. Describing the center of his project at Duisburg Nord, Lotz wrote, the symbol of this park is a metamorphosis of the existing hard and rugged industrial structure into a public park. Iron plates that were once used to cover casting molds in the pig iron casting work form today the heart of the park. In each of these cases, fresh air overcomes some localized stagnation. The painter's studio or art gallery in Manet's case, the heavily walled schoolhouse of pre Montessori education for Doiker, the fortress church of colonial Christianity for Cheto, and the hackneyed conventions of garden design for Lotz. Obviously, these are different kinds of sites, pictorial, spatial, institutional, and ecological. Differences can also be seen in the consequences of opening inherited conventions to fresh air. For the impressionist painter, the hard and isolated objects of the world lost their distinct edges and became saturated with integrating light. For the designer of open classrooms, children and learning began to enjoy otherwise unknown freedoms. For the student of colonial practices, cultures that had been combative found common ground. And for the ecologically minded designer, a threatened planet began to show signs of life. I'll return to these distinctions later, but just now want to identify something my cases hold in common. The historian Yaroslav Pelikan once wrote, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Each of the four I've cited rejected the traditionalist mentality. That might seem an obvious move for painters, architects, or landscape architects active in the modern period. Yet their denial of this mentality did not lead them to discard or neglect the past. Even the most strident of progressives cannot reject history, for without it as a frame of reference, modernity could never distinguish its advances. For the leaders of the modern movement, the great, the greatest advocate of traditionalism was the academic. I'll cite Le Corbusier. In Precisions, page you see here, he explained that architecture was suffering because academism was clutching the vital parts of the social body. As there are no schools without teachers, his next question became, 
who is the academician, who is the academic? The answer, you can read it there, he writes, the academic is the one who does not judge by himself, who accepts results without verifying their causes, who believes in absolute truths, and who does not involve his own self in every question. While hard for a professor to read, and perhaps hard also for professors to hear, Corbusier felt that this complaint explained why he had no position concerning the schools and refused the teaching jobs he'd been offered. Historically speaking, there was a time when there were artist and artistic practices, but no academies of art. Likewise, architects and their practices managing quite nicely without professors and courses. Where are we in this history? Conscious of its beginning, do we now sense its end? Has the business of teaching, our well-administered and market-sensitive approach, has it put an end to real learning? Not only confusing teaching with learning, but also advancement with education, a diploma with competence, fluency with the ability to say something new or relevant. Haven't places of learning become places of employment for teachers, researchers, and their administrators? If so, should we not admit the fact that they stifle both students and the discipline? Or am I overstating the case? After all, the number and size of schools continues to grow. Presumably, schools of architecture would come to an end if all professors adopted Le Corbusier's stance, let's say witnessing the twilight of the academy. Please don't get nervous. <laughs> That's not my recommendation. Nor is my interest in these passages quite so apocalyptic. At the outset of the quotation, Le Corbusier shifted his target from the academy to the academic, aiming to illustrate his point by making the question personal. What's more, he sharpened his focus in his final indictment, quote, the academic is the one who does not involve his or her own self in every question. What does the involvement of the self require? When or how does it occur? Among architecture professors these days, I'd say self-awareness is not in short supply. Expectations for originality or uniqueness in course offerings encourage it, as do standards for appointment and promotion. Faced with the latter, all faculty write intellectual biographies and research agendas. Administrators, search committees, and funding agencies ask for them with what I'd say is fatiguing frequency. In the architecture professor's self-construction, two models seem to provide acceptable formats. The scientific researcher, whose studies lead to individual expertise, and the creative artist, whose inspirations also grant distinction. Uniqueness is likewise expected in teaching, especially studio teaching. While some schools still describe studios topically, one devoted to urban, another to technological issues, most of these days, most I've seen, come to identify studios by an instructor's name. Generally, this form of designation assumes an approach, not a subject will be taught. Often, this is an approach to the whole of architecture, including particular modes of representation, themes taken to be essential, preferred vocabularies, or successful ways of building. When this style of teaching becomes the norm, not an exception, the curriculum never develops momentum because the same subjects are introduced repeatedly at all levels. Each studio represents yet another beginning, meaning no one of them allows understanding to be deepened. Distinctions between approaches are particularly clear in consideration of the manner or techniques to be learned. For the moment, I don't want to criticize this notion of a curriculum. 
only say that it allows for the development of not one, but many academies within a single school. An old name for an institution composed of teachers dedicated to the transmission of their own techniques is polytechnic, which is obviously something different from a university or college. So I want to ask again, has this transformation occurred? Have we returned to the polytechnic model? Do any of our schools still represent schools of thought? Or is a new Alexandrianism the preferred alternative? If one believes that a student's freedom of choice within a course of study is more important than his or her understanding of the discipline subjects, this vision of the school as a loose association of little academies will seem a good thing. For my part, I think otherwise. In fact, I believe it indicates a failure of leadership and a lack of vision. At the very least, a flattening or deflation of the architecture curriculum. But just now my question is more basic. Is the teacher who leads such a studio or course an academic in the Corbusier's sense of the word? Once again, the academic is the person who does not get involved in the question being asked, the one for whom the answer is already clear before the course begins, the one who expects young designers to do as he or she does or young history students to acquire a body of material familiar to the teacher. Such an instructor poses but does not wonder about the topic under study. The master of an atelier, the expert in one or another software package, may or may not fit this profile. The fundamental issue is involvement of the self. Throughout his writings, Corbusier used the idea of play to indicate participation of this sort. It seems a two-part movement is required, playing with and being played by the topic or situation. For both movements to occur in education, the players must find common ground. For this to happen, the teacher's superior knowledge and experience must be put in abeyance temporarily so that he or she can meet the student on equal terms. I do not mean the roles of teacher and student should be reversed, nor do I think parity is appropriate for all subjects. T teachers and students can operate on common ground when topics of a certain kind are under consideration. But absent the willingness to play with the topic or participate in questioning, the professor will either become or remain an academic. Following the Corbusier, I believe nothing in education is quite so stultifying. So what sorts of topics allow teachers and students to wonder together? A negative reply should be clear already. Teaching technique will not serve this purpose. Know-how is precisely what the teacher possesses and the student lacks. Knowledge of technique also accounts for the asymmetry that characterizes academic situations. Moreover, teaching technique tends to support the remoteness Corbusier sought to overcome. Mutuality of involvement and parity of footing require another framework, one that must be there from the start if it's to be there at all. The philosopher Plato once wrote, the flute player, not the flute maker, knows the true size and shape of the flute. Closer to our time, and rather more ironically, Adolf Loos asserted, only those who lack table manners are able to invent new forks and knives. Each statement posits first the distinction and then a ranking between two kinds of knowledge. N knowledge how to do or make something seems to be subordinate to knowing what it is that should be made. 
method to purpose, technical to cultural knowledge. Here then is my suggestion that the latter, cultural knowledge, can serve, in fact always does serve, as the ground on which teachers and students can become mutually involved in primary architectural questions. When the topic of study is a practical situation, listening to a concert, attending a funeral, or drinking a coffee, blind prejudice alone allows the professor to maintain that his or her knowledge is superior to the students. When the question being asked concerns cultural norms and their transformation, when it draws upon the kind of knowledge philosophers have always called ethical, students have a voice that is equal to that of their teachers, or so they should. This is because students know more than a little about architecture before they enter professional programs. They know the houses, institutions, and cities in which they've lived or visited. More importantly, they know the social practices and cultural meanings those situations embody through their own direct experience and through the literature and films they like and can recall. One of the greatest difficulties of teaching, maybe the greatest difficulty of teaching, is helping students discover relationships between their pre-professional and our professional understanding of the built world. Put simply, successful teaching enables this discovery, builds this bridge. Leaving aside for a moment the teaching of skills, I'd say that a primary and often overlooked task of architectural education is deepening of a student's pre-professional understanding, which means helping him or her understand more fully what he or she already knew before the studios and courses began. Earlier, I called analogous structures of this type of knowledge pre-conquest institutions. Yet, there's another context of understanding that exists at the margins of professional study. Once students arrive at the university, they quickly discover faculty outside their home department know something about the field too. I mean colleagues in history, engineering, folklore, and so on. Although some architecture professors prefer to keep this quiet, their awareness of extra departmental interest and understanding is obvious as soon as their reading lists are reviewed. Although I argue in a few minutes that there are many sites of learning in our field, I'll summarize these last observations now by saying that architectural understanding develops in basically three territories. Pre-professional, professional, and post-professional situations. Richard Wesley, chair of Penn's undergraduate programs, has used these places of learning or kinds of knowledge to structure not only a path of study in our field, but also a curriculum. At entry level in Penn's undergraduate program, students take studios that allow them to discover the architectural dimensions, qualities, and structures of the world they know before disciplinary education. This means learning, maybe rediscovering, learning about or rediscovering the human body, its proportions, surface curvature, structural orthogonality, movements, conformity to objects, and so on. After this, in the second year of studies, the world of architecture is introduced. Concentration on matters of site, construction, and program allows second year students to see that the work as something built somewhere for human purposes. Studies of materials, their congeniality to place, capacities for finishing, their temperatures, and so on, are particularly helpful toward this end. Likewise, the development of prosthetic objects as they conform to and remain distinct from the skin surfaces. Watch this. 
offer the same level of understanding. After a preliminary series of surveys and the construction of analogous models of prosaic habits, tumbling, walking, steps, etc., students in the third year's theory courses in studios are guided toward an understanding of the world beyond architecture, as described in film and painting, for example, but also urban topography particularly our Philadelphia. And together with that, environmental or ecological science. Let me repeat, three worlds, before, of, and beyond architecture. This program of study is not pre-professional. Put in reverse, which is to say positively, it introduces architecture as a way of knowing and acting in the world a kind of knowledge like others taught in the liberal arts. While I do not want to argue that professional programs should be modeled on pre-professional course of study, I do believe that the three worlds of architecture just listed include sources that might supply professional education with some fresh air. Rendered philosophically, the path or plot I've outlined is structured as follows. Cultural experience serves as the discipline's prefiguration. The basic subjects of our field allow for its configuration. And interdisciplinary studies point toward architecture's possible reconfiguration. Accordingly, a basic question to be asked of architectural education in our time is this. How can professional studies take account of the architectural knowledge that exists at the limits of the discipline. In the pre-professional, which is to say broadly cultural knowledge that entering students bring to their programs, and in the post-professional or interdisciplinary understanding that exists elsewhere in the university, often serving as the subject matter of fascinating research in the humanities and sciences. I believe programs that seal themselves off from these wider frames of reference run the risk of recirculating stale air, even if such teaching results in the production of forms that seem novel or the use of representational techniques that are new or newest on the market. The notion that there are distinct worlds of architecture before study in and beyond it suggests Architecture professors are not the only source of architectural knowledge. I don't intend this to be a defeating observation, only a statement of fact, one that's key to the reconceptualization of our programs. Learning, I want to suggest, sometimes results in the deepening of a student's pre-professional awareness of the built world. Other times, in the acquisition of professional vocabulary, concepts, examples, and most importantly, skills, but at other times in the widening of architectural understanding through comparative studies. Over the years, I've observed that while they're in school, students develop these and other forms of understanding in different ways, which is to say, in contact with different kinds of people in different kinds of places. So my next question, from whom? From whom does a student learn about architecture? The first answer is plain, from teachers, among whom are junior and senior members of the faculty, each a full or part-time academic, occupied outside the classroom or studio with scholarship or professional practice, sometimes both. As argued above, this group of teachers is larger than those in a student's home department. It includes university colleagues in many other fields. But the academy, Corbusier pointed out, does not have a monopoly on the supply of architectural understanding. Students also learn from one another. A good deal of sharing occurs in and outside the places of formal instruction. Also the testing of ideas and criticism, some of it combative. And there's a third source of understanding or learning that should not be overlooked, the student, him or herself. Given the range of these sources, 
it seems to me another question that should be taken up in the revision or design of curricula and programs is how these varied sources can be acknowledged and given a role. There's a similarly wide range of places in which architectural understanding develops. Again, some are obvious. The seminar, studio, and jury room. Also shops, wet and dry, manual and digital, and libraries, not only architectural, not only university, and the student's desk. But there are unofficial places in and outside the school building that are no less important than those within it. My earlier fresh air examples to which I promised a return will help me substantiate this final point. Despite Mallarmé's preoccupation with the effects of fresh air on Manet's paintings, one should not assume the openness they indicate reduce the importance of structure, composition, or configuration within a given image or a given curriculum. Although Manet's figures do absorb the influences of the ambient environment, they also preserve their stability as identifiable subjects. Two years before Mallarmé published the text I've cited, Manet spent several weeks visiting Claude Monet at Argentil on the banks of the Seine. While there, and in contact with not only Monet, but Renoir and Pizarro, he executed a number of works that have led some critics to call him an impressionist. A good example is a painting named after this place, Argentil. Much of what Balamé observed about plein air paintings characterizes the image, the outpouring of light, play of shadows, indefinite edges of objects, their absorption into the atmosphere, and so on. While fresh air has taken hold of the picture's subjects, they have not lost their stability, nor have the relationships between them been dissolved. I'll mention just one aspect of the image's structure the repetition and tension between verticals and horizontals. The painting's right side stacks a number of lines that parallel the horizon. The foreground parapet at the bottom of the image, the rolled parasol above it, extending the line of the boatman's arms, still higher the stripes of his shirt, then the line of the shore, and lastly, the skyline of the town. The left side, hers, offers a contrasting play of verticals, beginning near the edge with the mast of the boat, repeated by others in the distance, amplified by the stripes on her dress, as well as her upright posture, and completed, I think, by the smokestack in the distance, which suggests, when extended downward by the lines at the end of the sail, that the boatman's diagonal advance has not overcome the divide he so plainly regrets she so clearly insists on. Were one to compare the structure of this image to that of a well-conceived curriculum, the arguments of each can be seen to tell a story. Fresh air in both cases serves to quicken, enliven, and animate structure, not defeat or disintegrate it. Nor did the dematerialization of the wall proposed by Doiker mean the elimination of elements that gave the building stability and permanence, resulting in indefinite planning, like the pluralism often advocated in architectural education today. I've said Doiker's aim was to maximize light, sunshine, and fresh air, also to provide the possibility for open air instruction. Stacking classrooms in a vertical structure may have been a solution without precedent, but it had wonderful consequences. Air and light were maximized within minimum build volume, and dark and airless corridors were entirely eliminated. If the building can be seen as a curriculum made out of reinforced concrete, heated floors, and operable windows, one can say its openness assumes 
not a loose association of independent parts, the polytechnic arrangement, but a carefully structured organization of components that don't duplicate but depend on the distinct contributions of others in the supply of all the institution requires. The atria of Mexico's open chapels accommodated both Indian and Iberian institutions. I mentioned worship, education, healing, burial, and so on. Similar to the impact of pre-professional on professional understanding, vernacular traditions redefined official practices. A good example of this redefinition is the transformation of sacred processions on feast days. Processions not only marched into and around the atrio, but also developed there into dances. On the one hand, the dances paced by drums and feathered leaders might seem insignificant concomitants of Christian ritual. But contemporary reports suggest that native peoples understood them as new ways of acknowledging old deities, those that had been venerated in the past. Was the dance a pagan intermezzo in a Christian celebration or an evidence of mutuality discovered after ossified or academic forms had been abandoned. I hope it's clear I see it as the latter and want to recommend a similar interchange between departmental and non-departmental studies in architecture. When an audience rings the stage at the center of Piazza Metallica in Latz's Duisburg Nord, an analogous transformation is accomplished. What were once plates for casting molds became props of a theatrical performance, the most fundamental of props, for they've come to serve as the basis for the site's renewed cultural relevance. While arranged in a new form, decontextualized one could say, traces of their original purpose remain. Likewise for other places in the landscape, Pre-existing forms have submitted to reuse, even misuse, without disavowing their past. I think a similar sort of accumulation, accumulation of content occurs in education. Layers building upon layers, each of the latter enabling a deeper understanding of the former without rejecting or superseding them. The presentation of a subject in depth, history, for example, or technology, the differentiation of the ways it's offered to students who possess different levels of understanding does not require that its horizontal connections to other subjects be severed. I believe this is the prospect and the promise of the ecology represented by Latz's project an understanding of the natural world that sees human nature as one of its dimensions. Human nature that involves historical knowledge, cultural practices, and the making of artifacts, including rooms, buildings, and towns. Even if, even if the programs of study we've inherited were initially well conceived and carefully designed, they inevitably run the risk of becoming stale over time, maybe even suffocating. When this occurs, when the academy becomes too academic, when teachers and students cease to involve their own selves in the questions being asked, I'd say it makes a great deal of sense to face facts. Renewal not rejection of educational structure is the task. A task that will become more manageable if we recognize that pre and post professional understanding, the worlds before and beyond professional education can provide it with 
with abundant sources of fresh air. Thank you very much.